Riku is a character that some would argue has more development than Sora in the Kingdom Hearts series. Many found his arc dealing with darkness profound and thought-provoking, an interesting dynamic that pits Riku against Sora for a time before shifting to a very fulfilling redemption arc. During the release of Kingdom Hearts 3 though, I heard some complaints of Riku being boring, and I always found that really interesting. While it is true that Riku took a backseat in Kingdom Hearts 3, I like to believe that there was a reason for that. I think we can use Riku's arc throughout the Dark Seeker saga as an analogy of what some people may experience when dealing with depression. I think Riku gives some great examples of what it looks like to go through depression. Welcome to the Psychology of Riku. If you don't know who I am, I'm Byroxus. I usually do deep dives into the mechanics and combat animations for the Kingdom Hearts series. Lately though, I've been wanting to use my background in psychology and break down the psychology of different characters. One thing I do want to note is that obviously Riku is a video game character, so we are not going to diagnose Riku with depression, since there's a lot more that goes into a diagnosis than just checking the boxes on some symptoms. What I do want to do with this video though is use Riku's story to talk about depression and create discussion about how that can look and feel. Lastly, this video is in no way a rebuttal to Tanil's Riku is Gay video essay, and I want to make that clear right at the beginning. With us both doing a character analysis on Riku, we are going to be using the same cutscenes, but extracting different meaning from those scenes. Do not take that to mean that I am trying to make points against his video. The focus of my video is to use these characters in Kingdom Hearts and draw parallels to mental health. I don't want my video being used as evidence or talking points against Tanil or the queer community in general. While this video may lack commentary on the queer aspects that some people find in Riku and his journey, this is not because I think it shouldn't be talked about, but because I don't feel that like I have the experience or knowledge to speak on it. What I will say is that many queer people strongly resonate with Riku's story, and I think there's significance to that. If you haven't seen that video before and it piques your interest, uh, I'll have Tanil's video linked below and in the iCard in the corner. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's dive into Riku's story and see how depression shows up in his life and how he wrestles with it. We'll actually start this by looking at the young Riku in Birth by Sleep. Here it doesn't appear that Riku really experiences any depressive symptoms, but he does give us a peek at some of his core values. The most important value seems to be that Riku believes that he needs to be strong to protect what matters. This is a good belief to have, but if held to a stringent expectation for oneself, it can lead to some really dark places if you end up having, I don't know, say a cataclysmic event that destroys your world and scatters everyone you've ever known and loved. This belief is only reinforced by Terra and the Keyblade Ceremony, seeing as how Riku continued to keep this secret throughout the series. Let's see how this belief impacts Riku as he grows up. Riku starts out pretty confident in Kingdom Hearts 1, or at least that's how he tries to appear. He chides both Sora and Kairi as he seems to be the only one working on the raft. He's always been a guide for Sora and also Kairi when she appeared on the islands. It echoes his sentiments from Birth by Sleep nicely, having become a strong person to protect what matters to him. During the opening of Kingdom Hearts 1, we get a look at some of Riku's thoughts as he wonders, out of all the other supposed worlds out there, why did they end up on this one? He makes the comment of it being the same old stuff, and expresses discontent with his old way of life. Kairi seems to be the catalyst for this causing him to think often about what the point of his life on the islands is for. Riku has talked about leaving before, but Kairi seems to hasten this thinking and need along. This all comes to a head when a storm strikes the islands and the world begins to descend into darkness. The door was thrown open and darkness had found its way to the heart of the world. Riku's world is literally crumbling around him and his response is to accept the darkness, almost dragging Sora down with him. Now I want to put a pin here because there is a lot that happens during this moment that we learn from in later games. We soon find out that Ansem has been whispering in Riku's ear, filling his thoughts with the outside world and darkness. If the events of Chain of Memories are to be believed, Riku was the one who threw open that door. Ansem was kind of like an inner voice that Riku listened to, one that hit on those insecurities he already held. Ansem fanned those flames of hopelessness over being stuck on that island, and maybe even some feelings of powerlessness since Riku turned to the darkness to grow stronger. I feel like many can relate to this situation if you put a very specific lens on it. Many of us have a tendency for negative thoughts to crop up that can encourage a spiral into a depressed mood. We can convince ourselves that we are worthless, and if we continue down that line of thinking, our world may feel like it's crumbling as we isolate and feel as though we have lost those we care about. Thoughts can have such an impact on our feelings, and more importantly how we react to things. If we aren't aware and don't actively change those thoughts we are telling ourselves, it can set us up to spiral hard. I think this shows up pretty well with Riku's story, with Ansem and Maleficent kind of symbolically acting as those negative thoughts, grabbing a hold of his deepening fears and insecurities, coaxing him further and further along into the darkness. 
mind you, Riku still makes those decisions himself. I'm not saying that just because we may have a negative thought or fall into a depressed mood that the actions we make are out of our control. Many people look for relief from those thoughts and feelings through a variety of ways that can be healthy or unhealthy. In Riku's case, the relief he believed he needed was the strength he was given from the darkness. It shows how important it is to be mindful of that inner voice. Riku doesn't want to be seen as weak, and will do whatever he can to make sure that other people don't see it. When he arrives at Hollow Bastion, we can see the panic he has at being alone, but then he covers that fear up to play it cool in front of Sora. We know this is a cover since we see Maleficent driving the dagger in when Sora looks to be pairing up with Donald and Goofy rather than going with Riku. Some people may say that Riku is overreacting here, but when you're dealing with depression, it's really common to have thoughts of hopelessness or worthlessness. This becomes the lens that you see the world through, and you think things like, well, if I was a better friend, they wouldn't leave me, or if I was stronger, I wouldn't be in this situation. Stuff like that. It's also important to note that Sora is one of Riku's most important people. To see Sora going and connecting with other people would probably be heartbreaking for Riku, stirring up again those feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness. Riku's main focus throughout Kingdom Hearts 1 is saving his friends, though it shifts to just saving Kairi after he feels abandoned by Sora. Or rather, it almost feels like he wants to be the one to save Kairi so he can hurt Sora. He is fixated on this goal, which I feel is how depression can present sometimes as well. Through that same lens we talked about before of hopelessness, people can fixate on a goal. Riku might be thinking things like, I need to be the one to save Kairi no matter what. Through this thought pattern, anything that gets in the way of this goal is going to create distress, which can show up in a couple different ways. This shows up for Riku as him becoming antagonistic towards Sora, pushing on Sora's insecurities and lashing out at him. Riku of course still cares for Sora, since we see that when Sora is in trouble, Riku is right there to help. At least this is what happens at first. Before Riku finally decides to cut off Sora, he reaches out one more time. Maybe it holds the key to helping Kairi. How about it, Sora? Let's join forces to save her. We can do it together. What? You'd rather fight me? Over a puppet that has no heart? Heart or no heart, at least he still has a conscience. Conscience? I think there are two goals that Riku has. One is to save Kairi, and the other is to reconnect with Sora. When he feels as though Sora is rejecting him, in an effort to reduce his distress, he cuts Sora off. This can be how some people manage their depression, or how isolation can appear sometimes. In an effort to lower that distress while grappling with depression, people may tend to cut ties with others to unconsciously protect themselves. As we get near the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, we can see Riku's affect has greatly changed. No longer is he a sarcastic or arrogant kid, he's become quiet, defeated almost. He sinks further into the darkness, thinking this is who he is now. When people struggle with depression, they can shift so much in their mood that those who knew them prior to the struggle may see a huge shift in personality. I think this happens near the end of the game before Riku is taken over by Ansem. He has completely blocked his feelings towards Sora, creating a barrier between them as he continues towards his goal. The darkness is how he copes, and is how Riku feels powerful like he has control, so he continues to feed into it. Like I said before, when people deal with depression, the deeper it gets, the more they look for relief from that which can be really unhealthy. The more Riku turns to the darkness, the closer he gets to completely losing who he was as a person. I think this parallels greatly with Ansem taking over him. The more that we fall into that depression, the greater the likelihood is that we will isolate and fall deeper into that depression. It can lead us to do things that can hurt those around us who are closest to us. I want to take a moment to note here that this is not meant to blame those struggling with depression. What I want to do is identify how this illness can impact us and those around us if it continues to go untreated. I think Kingdom Hearts 1 shows Riku's depression at its deepest, but that's not all he is. He is angry and has isolated himself from Sora, the person most important to him, but even through his struggles, he is still trying to help his friend. Lost in a sea of confusion and doubt, Riku strives towards the one thing he thinks will make him feel better and return his life to normal, saving Kairi. Despite this video's focus being on the darkness and depression surrounding Riku, I think it is important to point out that all of this started from good intentions. Riku wants to be a support for his friends, but he puts so much expectation and pressure on himself without leaning on others that it ends up taking him to a really dark place, eventually being possessed by Ansem. Speaking of Ansem, I don't want to read into Riku's actions and words too much after he gets taken over by Ansem due to how muddy that can get with the personalities merging, so I want to jump forwards a bit to when Riku returns. This is the moment when Riku finally breaks back through Ansem's control. 
I love this scene because sometimes when you're dealing with depression, it really can feel like you're holding back this monster of dark thoughts and feelings, barely holding on and keeping your identity. There are times with depression where you may have a brief respite from some of your depressive symptoms, a break where things feel slightly better. It takes everything in you to even make an effort for change or to seek help, and during these breaks are the best times to push yourself to get help. This part though when Riku comes back up for air is also an example of why some people with depression isolate. There's this feeling of, if I'm depressed, I'll drag others down with me. Which is kind of what Riku is doing, right? He doesn't want them to be hurt by his darkness or by Ansem, and so in an effort to not hurt them, he pushes them away and, and tries to keep Ansem at bay. This isolating behavior also shows up in the final scene we see of Riku. Seemingly, he has returned back to his old self, encouraging Sora as he closes himself off once again. His first inclination is to cut himself off, to isolate himself. I think it's pretty safe to assume that Riku's go-to coping skill, or the way that he copes with distress or his depression, is to isolate. And we'll see this happen throughout the next few games. Kingdom Hearts 1 is the deepest that Riku's depression or depressive symptoms get. The rest of the series focuses on his redemption arc, and I want to follow this because I think it parallels nicely with people's struggles with depression. Those with chronic depression don't just suddenly feel better and never struggle again. It's a journey of working on oneself, and it eventually gets to a stable point. But it takes a long time and a lot of work to get to that point. I also want to focus on Riku's journey because I feel that the global perspective on depression is focused on when it's at its worst, but then the growth and work afterwards is kind of pushed to the wayside. So I really appreciate that Kingdom Hearts takes the time to actually show um, Riku's journey, not just with the dark side, right, but, but him moving towards that recovery and that way to dawn. Chain of Memories, Days, and Kingdom Hearts 2 show this journey to stability, which is not a straight line. It's a winding dark road that sometimes causes us to stumble or fall backwards. Chain of Memories portrays the struggle that can happen with negative thinking patterns, which is seen as Riku battles the darkness within himself and tries to move forward. While it may differ, all of us have some kind of thought process. Some have an inner monologue, almost like you're narrating what you're doing, while others may have more structured thoughts about what needs to be done. Regardless of how you think, we all interpret the world around us and have some kind of thoughts and feelings about what we are interpreting. The cognitive behavioral model focuses on these thoughts as that model believes that thoughts impact how we feel, which impacts how we react to things. So negatively focused thoughts will generally give us more negative feelings, which typically means more negative reactions. Targeting the thoughts can change how we feel, which changes how we react. We get to see Riku do some of that thought targeting and combating throughout Chain of Memories. When Riku originally wakes up in Castle Oblivion, he is encouraged to keep sleeping, to stay stagnant. Aligning this with depression, it's kind of like that low energy that makes it hard to even get out of bed sometimes, and our thoughts that tell us it's not worth it to even get out of bed. As Riku journeys through these different worlds in Castle Oblivion, he is met face to face with his mistakes. The actions that he chose impacted so much around him, and facing that mirror is definitely tough. Getting into those thoughts and continuing to dwell on the past, thinking about what he could have or should have done, will inevitably cause him to spiral back towards depression. There's this line when he is seeing his old room that is so cutting it almost hurts. You cast away your home, your friends, everything, but at least they gave you a nice room. Like I did with Kingdom Hearts 1, I want to use the people that Riku faces as symbolism for negative thinking patterns. We are our own worst enemy, and our thoughts can show that. We know exactly what to say to ourselves to really drive a dagger into our heart or push on our insecurities. Of course, we can work on fighting back against these thinking patterns, and Riku's journey through Castle Oblivion showcases this pretty well. Riku's biggest insecurities are on full display here, with most of his enemies touching on his actions and how he hurt his friends. He is actively combating what the voices are saying though, not wanting to fall back into that darkness and lose himself again. Changing thoughts can be broken down into three stages, awareness, catching, and reframing. We can't make any meaningful change until we start becoming aware of the problem. This awareness is something we see Riku have a grasp on near the beginning of his journey through Castle Oblivion. The awareness phase in terms of depression and negative thinking can be a little miserable since there is no active change happening. You just begin to be aware of how hard you are on yourself or how negative your thinking has become. It's really not a place you want to hang out in too long, you know? <laughs> the darkness you thought you would come out of with depression before is still there, ever present, waiting to drag you back in if you aren't careful. During this phase of change, it's important to have supports around you that you can hold on to. 
This can be friends or family, like with Riku having Mickey appear to help him. Or it can be other ways of self-soothing or distraction if those thoughts become too strong to handle. Like Riku's hand clenching that he kind of unconsciously does a lot. As this awareness continues, you'll shift towards catching those negative thoughts, stopping them in their tracks. I like to think that the people that Riku faces all hit on some of the negative thoughts that he wrestles with and has to stop himself from thinking. And some touches on those insecurities around Riku's weakness, reminding him that at one point he gave up everything just to be more powerful. Vexen hits on those thoughts of where Riku belongs, making the point that Riku still has darkness inside of him and stands in the twilight between the light and darkness. At this point, Riku sees darkness as evil and light as good, so having to grapple with his identity and possibly being a mix of both is tough and messy for him. It's confusing and makes it hard for him to find clarity. Lexius then calls into question that fear that Riku holds about the darkness and the confusion he holds in his heart, literally saying, I will not yield to the frail heart of an infantile coward. At this point, Riku starts to shift forward in this catching phase. This catching is a skill that has to be worked on, like a muscle it needs to be focused on and will get better and stronger with practice. At some point, of course, we'll want to shift from just catching thoughts to reframing thoughts, um, which we'll go over later. Seeing some of the evolution of Riku's catching though, Riku consistently is told that he has darkness inside of him and that he is just like the enemies he is fighting against. At first, when he becomes aware of this, he fights against their accusations, stopping their words eventually and silencing their voices, which we have seen either by Riku literally eliminating the enemy or using force to push them away. Riku is able to stand strong and continue, both catching these accusations and trying to not let them get to him, but also relying on the support of Mickey when sometimes the thoughts start to become too much for him. This comes to a climax when we reach Zexion in the Destiny Islands. Riku is met face to face with one of his most painful memories, the destruction of his home. Zexion is a master of honing in on Riku's every insecurity. Many hearts were forever lost to the darkness because of what you did! You hated being an islander, so you opened the door to darkness and destroyed the islands. It was you! You were pulled into the darkness then, and now you belong to the darkness. Zexion even uses Sora against Riku, having his closest friend question who he is anymore. He makes it seem like Riku has fallen deep into the darkness. Here though, in such a dark moment, Riku gains clarity. He comes to terms with who he is. All of these fears and insecurities that the organization members honed in on suddenly lose their power as Riku understands that if he can stare into the darkness and accept what has happened, the darkness won't have power over him anymore. This is the final step in combating negative thoughts, reframing. Riku has reframed what darkness means to him and what this darkness through that depression is. Coming to terms with himself and who he is changes from a path into depression and darkness and instead becomes the road to dawn. Even Riku's replica acknowledges this. The replica is something I wanted to address, but wasn't exactly sure where to put him here. It's really interesting seeing a glimmer of an alternate world where Riku didn't have the supports around him that he needed. The replica completely relies on the darkness, using it to save Namine, just like how Riku did in Kingdom Hearts 1 to save Kairi. This goal becomes all-consuming, and Namine eventually has to crush his heart just to ensure he doesn't hurt Sora. Having Riku's insecurities added on top of this replica, literally having an identity crisis, causes him to continue to spiral eventually ending with his demise. It's pretty sobering to think that the real Riku could have headed in the same direction if he hadn't been able to reconcile who he was in the darkness. If he hadn't been able to reframe his thoughts and change how he viewed his battle with light and darkness, he may have been consumed by the darkness and pulled down into oblivion. A lot of times we look at our journey through depression as a hole that we sink into, a bottomless abyss that seeks to consume us. In reality though, it's kind of like a dark winding road, that if we can keep our head up and use the supports around us, can become a road that leads to hope and recovery, a road to dawn. Of course, it's not like this one single reframe of his negative thoughts and his darkness magically healed Riku and he'll never deal with depression again. We see in Days and Kingdom Hearts 2 that he still grapples with the guilt and shame of his actions, coping in unhealthy ways and even slipping backwards slightly. In Days, Riku has his blindfold on to make sure that the darkness within him doesn't take over. It also symbolizes though that isolation that Riku tends to default to when he doesn't know how to cope with something. Despite the insight he found in Chain of Memories, he fears that chance of him falling back into the darkness. That resolve of walking through the darkness wavers here for some reason, and I love how the blindfold is symbolic of this. His depression appears to deepen here as he loses his way. We even see like basic self-care needs like his hair growing out where he's not even taking care of like the basic self-care needs. 
with depression, sometimes we make progress and then stagnate. In an effort to decrease the distress we feel, we don't acknowledge it or we might even turn a blind eye to it. It's interesting that both times we have seen Riku actively distracting himself from the work he needs to do on himself, it involves Sora in some way. The guilt and shame of how much of Sora's life has been upended is still something that Riku is grappling with. As we near the end of days, we see that Riku willingly gives in, accepting his fate in darkness and once more sinking into that depression, beginning to isolate. Riku genuinely believes this is the only way to save Sora, to sacrifice himself. If it changes me forever. Throughout the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2, Riku stays in the shadows, unable to bring himself to talk to Sora. He still tries to help though in his own way in some of the Disney worlds. We don't see much development until the end of the game, when Sora finally reunites with Kairi and Riku. Sora at first doesn't recognize him, so changed by the darkness is Riku. During this interaction, we actually get some insight into Riku's thought process here. He believes himself worthless, a castaway in the darkness. He only finds himself useful if he helps other people, but sees no worth in and of himself. The shame of turning back to the darkness caused him to regress a bit in his beliefs about himself, but also when we constantly struggle with negative thinking patterns, it chisels away at the self-esteem, impacting it greatly. His plan was to go it alone, until he was worthy of coming back to his friends, or he would die trying. The funny thing about that thinking process is, for a lot of people, when they think that they have to do something to be worthy enough, the expectation for that is almost never attainable. Anyways, Riku's love for his friends is what brings him back. His supports returning to him is what helps him in a way. Though he still tries to push them away to protect them, Riku steps in front of the light to save them. This interaction with his friends changes something in him. It starts to push a bit on that negative thinking pattern he was trapped in. He begins to become aware of how detrimental his beliefs are, stating that he was lying and trying to fool himself when Sora asked why he was trying to do it all by himself. Through his friends, he was able to find the strength to begin fighting back against his beliefs again. And we can see that he's been thinking about this due to his profound statement during the standoff against Xemnas. Sort of makes you wonder why we are scared of the dark. It's because of who's lurking inside it. He discovered firsthand that the things lurking within the darkness were what dragged him down in the first place, not the darkness itself. And then, in one of the best moments of Kingdom Hearts 2, Sora and Riku face off against Xemnas, teaming up to quell the evil. As they succeed though, they are surrounded by countless nobodies. After a long battle, Riku falls. But Sora is there to be that shoulder to lean on. I love this symbolism. Riku, for one of the first times probably ever, uses the support of Sora. Multiple times he falls, but instead of fading into the darkness, he is able to use the support of Sora to continue on. This is probably one of the most profound, informative moments for Riku's journey. He was actually able to stumble and gain support from Sora, not having to solely rely on himself. Currently, this is the final time we see Riku fall into a depressive episode, but I want to highlight the rest of Riku's journey throughout the remaining games because I think the growth we see is important to look at. Before that though, I want to briefly touch on Coded. I hesitated at first to include Data Riku in this due to the knowledge that this really isn't Riku, but the journal using Riku as a vessel to protect the journal. The memories are not just Riku's inside this vessel, so the reactions and things said, I was a little unsure if they necessarily were something that I could extrapolate on. The parallels though to Riku are something that I think warrant a discussion. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but um, I did want to at least use this as a way to kind of highlight something that I've been meaning to talk about in the video. While I haven't exactly highlighted it, I think this is the perfect time and place to use this to talk about Riku's tendency to isolate. Whenever Riku is met with a problem, his first impulse is to isolate and try to take care of it himself. Data Riku, when the bugs are taking over, tries to take all the bugs in and sacrifice himself, similar to the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, where Riku closes himself in the realm of darkness, or the events of Days in Cage 2, where he willingly sacrifices his body, giving himself up and taking on the burden of darkness by himself to help his friends. It hurts him though, since multiple times now we have seen Riku express envy over the support and trust that Sora is able to garner from others. But it's not something that he's necessarily angry about. He willingly takes on this pain because he would rather endure that loneliness than have others experience it. 
Riku's tendency to isolate and sacrifice is something that shows up again in Kingdom Hearts 3. But let's first look at Riku's growth in Dream Drop Distance. Dream Drop Distance opens with the end Sid discussing the need for both Sora and Riku to take the Marker Mastery exam. I love Riku's reaction here. He acknowledges that there is still some weakness in him and wants to really test his resolve. With the tools that he has been building throughout the series, this is essentially the first time that he is able to actively and awarely work on himself. He's also at a point where he can probably help others push back against the unhelpful beliefs that they have. In one of the first worlds, he's able to help Quasimodo in his negative thoughts because he's experienced the same thing. This scene is so profound. I'll just let it play out right here. My master? He said he had business on the outskirts of the city. Do you mean you know him? Oh, yes. He's... he's very kind. Master Frollo saved my life. He protects me from the outside world. He protects you from it? The people out there would be cruel to me. I'm a... monster, you know. Is that what Frollo told you? Trust me. Looks can be deceiving. A good friend sees you for who you are, no matter what face you wear. You should go out there. Find some friends who understand you. Oh no. My master forbids it. I'm not to set foot outside. Are you sure that's what's stopping you? Because I think something else is holding you back. Ask your heart, Quasimodo. I'll check the edge of town. Thanks. Wish I could take my own advice. At the end, he shows some good insight as well, remarking that he wishes he could take his own advice. This boils down to the difference between knowledge of the solution and actually implementing that solution. Riku has that awareness of his tendency to wall up and isolate, as we've seen him do it multiple times now. It's what he naturally wants to do when his depression presents, to isolate himself. So he knows all too well the dangers of walling up his heart, and seeks to help Quasimodo avoid the same pitfall however he can. Another interesting moment in this world is when Ansem appears before Riku. Riku recites the phrase he came up with in Chain of Memories, that he walks the road to dawn. This almost seems to have become his mantra against the voices coaxing him back into the darkness. A mantra can be really helpful when a distressing event happens suddenly and we are seeking to calm ourselves down in the moment. People have all kinds of phrases they tell themselves and that they focus on during a triggering situation to help themselves stay calm and make it through that event. I can see this scene paralleling a moment when depressive symptoms start to flare up when one isn't ready for it. Reciting a phrase to keep us grounded in the moment so that we aren't dragged into the past can be really helpful. The important thing is grounding in the present and not letting ourselves slip into ruminating on the past. This is just one small technique of mindfulness. Um, I could probably do an entire video just talking about mindfulness and how helpful it is. Uh, but it's this idea of staying present focused, not focusing on the future, which can lead to anxiety, or focusing on the past, which can lead to depression. Uh, if you haven't heard of mindfulness, I really encourage you to look it up. There's some really helpful, easy to do things that can help with your uh, depression or anxiety. As Riku traverses the worlds, we get this lovely parallel to Kingdom Hearts 1, with Riku looking for Pinocchio and Monstro. Here he meets face to face with his past. Quite literally, actually. Seeing Riku being on the opposite side of this Pinocchio rescue, and seeing just how much he had changed during the events of Kingdom Hearts 1, forces him to reconcile his past actions and face what he did before. It's almost as if he's processing his past and reconciling his past actions in a way. If someone's depression stems from a past mistake or event, we have to accept that before we can move on, else we will continue to fall into that pit of despair when we spiral into thinking about it. There's this idea of what's called radical acceptance. This is all about accepting the things that are out of our control in order to lower distress. What's in the past can't be changed, and Riku seems to understand that in this point in time. Near the end of Dream Drop Distance, young Xehanort tries to chink away at Riku's resolve, but fails. Riku has accepted his darkness and his flaws, acknowledging the choices he made and where it led him. The darkness holds no more power over him, he isn't reactive anymore. There's a calmness that falls upon Riku from here on out, a confidence in his identity and who he is. Even when he sinks into the darkness and is faced by Ansem, he is calm and is able to succeed in quelling the darkness. 
This scene where he faces off against Ansem, his old darkness, is incredible. There's one quote from the grid that I was kind of trying to figure out where to put, but I think it fits here pretty nicely. People around you get hurt in the process. Like Xehanort, his single-minded thirst for answers created Ansem. We all have a little of that curiosity in us. So if we're not careful, any one of us could create an Ansem. Riku talks about how a singular focus on something can hurt those around you, and how curiosity is in everyone, which means that anyone could have the equivalent to an Ansem inside of them. This face-off against Ansem here is so profound and such a pivotal point in showing how much Riku has grown. In Kingdom Hearts 1, he reached out to Ansem, accepted his power in order to save Kairi. Now, with Sora and Nita saving, Ansem once again offers his power. Even with his preoccupation over his worthiness to wield a Keyblade because of his past, he says this. Ansem. Or... Xehanort. You used to be a Keyblade wielder. But darkness stole your heart. And the Keyblade with it. Don't you see? That's half the reason I'm even on this journey. After allowing darkness into my heart, am I still fit to wield the Keyblade? Even after locking you away, here you are, haunting me again. So I get it now. There's no point in trying to hold the darkness back. At last, you see clearly. You know, when I look at you, there's this memory that flashes back. A secret I said I'd keep when I was little. The main reason I kept dreaming about seeing the outside world was because of him. Mm -hmm. My journey begins here. And now, I'm going back to the real world. And then to Sora's side. That is your answer? Yes. I know the way. Consume the darkness. Return it to light. You can try. I love this moment. I've said it multiple times now, but the battle against oppression is an ongoing journey, and Riku understands that. Another great parallel is of Riku pulling Sora out of his darkness. Riku being able to brave the darkness and plunge into its depths to save his friend speaks volumes to his growth. The questions at the end of Dream Drop Distance do a nice job showing how much Riku has grown. Roxas? What is it that you're so afraid of? Before his journey, Riku would have answered these questions much differently. In Kingdom Hearts 1, his fear was hurting others. He was desperate to rectify his mistake of opening the Destiny Islands to darkness due to how it impacted his friends. Then during the events of Chain of Memories up to Kingdom Hearts 2, he probably would have answered getting trapped in the darkness. The Riku at the end of Dream Drop Distance though is afraid of losing something that's important, his close friends, which leads into the next question that he answers, he has learned that his friends are his power and a source of strength for him. He can lean on them when the times get tough and losing that would be a hard blow to handle. This leads into the next question. What is the one thing you care about more than anything else? I'm not sure when Riku believed this first answer, but we know that the strength to protect others was incredibly important to him in his past, which is what opened him up to darkness in the first place. Riku's close friends, though, are the most important thing to him. This has always been important to him, but it definitely becomes the most important thing throughout his journey. The last question is... Riku, what do you wish? To which he answers that he wishes to recover the important thing that he lost which we can pretty easily infer is Sora. For the other two answers, he has already accepted his past at this point. It may still hurt, or he may still have regrets, but he has healed from it, or rather, is on the road to recovery. Speaking to the last answer, protecting his friends infers that he wants to do everything in his power to save them, which he has found leads him down a dark road. Thus, recovering Sora is the most important to him, and all three of these questions highlight the importance that Riku holds for his friends. This ending scene really just underscores Riku's character growth in such a great way, showing a glimpse at his past again to contrast against his present self. Growth can sometimes be hard to track, so it's important to look inwards from time to time for some introspection.
In Kingdom Hearts 3, we get a pretty different Riku in my opinion. He is pretty stable and calm. Even Mickey picks up on it, commenting that Riku has an inner strength that he can see. I think some people saw this calmness as boring because Riku's big focal point was no longer these intense reactions to the darkness. I've already said it before, but Riku has become confident in who he is, no longer tempted by the darkness to sink into it. This consistency is different from the roller coaster that was Riku throughout Kingdom Hearts. So I think people mistake this calmness and non-reactiveness for Riku's character becoming boring. I beg to differ though. I think it's honestly pretty refreshing to see a character grow and change like we've been able to see with Riku. We get some really interesting interactions and insights because of it. Like when Aqua tells Riku that she will share the misery and despair she has in her heart, Riku retorts with an interesting line. There's no need. Got my own. He is no longer trying to push his uncomfortable emotions or thoughts down, but rather accepts those pieces of himself. The events and experiences from before are all too present in his mind, but rather than allowing that to control him and drag him into the darkness, he accepts those pieces of himself. After they save Aqua and are resting before the final battle, this conversation Riku has with his replica really got me thinking about the parallels between them. The replica showed Riku's path if he didn't change, his mind broken by despair and eventually letting the darkness fully consume him. The replica didn't want to save himself because he didn't have the friends and supports around him that Riku had. It was always about sacrificing himself, even to the point that he sacrifices himself to save Namine. It really is a testament to how important healthy supports are when you're going through a dark time. Speaking of dark times, Riku gets to act as that support for Sora when the light begins to expire. He's actively trying to combat Sora's despairing thoughts, but the despair is too much for Sora here. Riku despite that stands up to the darkness and sacrifices himself for Sora. Which has me feeling kind of... conflicted. Yes, I love that Riku sacrifices himself for Sora. We know that his friends are important, and Sora most of all, but I almost feel as though Riku slips back into that isolating mode again. He could have stood beside Sora, been that support, and tried to combat the darkness together with him, but he chooses to step in front to sacrifice himself alone. Yes, Sora still perishes here, as do they all, but the fact that in this moment, Riku steps forward kind of breaks my heart, and it shows that Riku really is still struggling. We all have our natural tendencies. It takes so much work and energy to fight back against those impulses, and in the heat of the moment, we can sometimes fall back and react in the way we are most comfortable with. That has me pretty interested and excited for the future of Riku's character. It shows that there is still an internal battle going on inside of him. Sometimes he is able to acknowledge he doesn't need to do everything by himself, as seen when he lets Sora chase after Kairi, rather than feeling a need to do it himself or join Sora in his endeavors. But other times he is still falling back to his old isolating behaviors, like when he travels to Quadratum alone to look for Sora. I like to read this section here with Ansem uh, as Riku kind of talking to his past self. Um, or to his, like, his past actions and his, his journey through darkness, where he almost like, he even says, like, I miss this. I'm going to miss this. Um, and I, I find that interesting because not that people choose to be in depression, right? Or choose to be depressed. Um, but sometimes we can feel more comfortable in that pain or in that, that darkness rather than branching out and, and moving towards something new. So I, I just thought that was pretty interesting. So, all in all, I'm really excited to see where Riku's character goes. There's still a lot to unpack here regarding his natural tendencies. And I think that is everything I wanted to share about the psychology of Riku. Depression presents differently for many people, and I hope this highlighted that well. I tend to find Sora and Riku very similar, so it was a little odd putting this together so soon after my deep dive into the psychology of Sora. Both want to be a source of support for their friends, but that shows up very differently between the two. When Sora is upset, he puts on a brave face, trying to smile and not draw attention to his own pain while still trying to be there for his friends. Riku is similar in the sense that he doesn't want to draw attention to himself, but rather than stay close to his friends, his first inclination is to isolate. Now I don't think that Riku is actively trying to push his friends away, he just thinks that in order to save his friends, it's easier to take the burden on by himself. This boiled down to what beliefs Riku held at first, that he needed the strength to protect his friends, which Riku believed was a solo mission. His isolating behavior is rooted in a lot of insecurity around his worth. We see during days in Kingdom Hearts 2 that he really doesn't have a high regard for himself. Having such a core belief about oneself is not easily changed and needs constant work to change that line of thinking. I'm really interested how these struggles that Riku has will show up in the future. We've already seen and established that this struggle Riku has will be ever-present. and. 
Riku is seemingly alone in Quadrata while he looks for Sora, so I wonder what will happen when darkness begins to show up. Will it play out like Dream Drop Distance, with Riku able to work through his insecurities and weaknesses, or will his time in isolation bring back some of his old habits? I'm interested to know your thoughts, so let me know down in the comments below. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This one seemed a little bit more clinical. I'm still trying to figure out um, exactly how much psychology I want to put into these videos and, and how much that impacts how easy it is to watch this video. So definitely give me some feedback down below. Huge thank you to my patrons and channel members. Their names will be on screen right now. If you want to join, you can do that for, I think, like a dollar. Any kind of support is greatly appreciated. If you're not in a position to do that, sharing this video, liking, commenting, word of mouth is so helpful for my videos to gain traction. Um, so if you want to do that, that would be so greatly appreciated. Really hope you guys enjoy these psychology videos. There's so much fun for me to, to kind of try to tie in some of my background uh, into, you know, one of my favorite series. Uh, I am planning uh, on shifting to other games. Keep an eye out for the next two videos that I'm working on, The Psychology of Aqua and The Psychology of Cloud from Final Fantasy VII.